it's very good to be here today and, and get a chance to talk with you. Um, I'll tell you, this is an interesting venue for me today to actually go through uh, and hear an opera to begin with in the morning. I'm not sure I'm fully uh, uh, comprehended what I what I got to see, but it was it was very good to to, to experience that, and then to get philosophy was also interesting. I was disappointed I didn't see calligraphy. It would have been even even better. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the powers of 10, and, and I look at the power of 10 kind of from an engineering standpoint. So we all know that if you take 1 and you take it to the power of 10, it's equal to 1, and like nothing happens, right? But if you have 2 and you take that to the power of 10, you actually get 1,024 which says there's a heck of a multiplying factor if you can come together and work together as a team and do things cooperatively. And I think you even saw that in George's charts where he talked about the advantages of us all working together. And, and that's a kind of a, a theme that I want to talk about with these charts today. And, and I call it now space, and I, I chose, stole this from Pat. And, and now is an acronym for me. It's not old or new. And then you have to capitalize the W in new to make it there, but it's not either old or new space, but it's just space. And so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit this morning. So first of all, let's, let's talk about collaboration and working together. And, and probably the first piece is the International Space Station. And I chose this picture because this was a unique time when we had on orbit uh, members from almost all the countries on board the, the space station, which is pretty unique. And, and if you look at these countries pulling together and having this vision and figuring out a framework to work together, there was tremendous uh, cooperation that had to come about. We all had to have a common goal and figure out ways to work through tremendous challenges going forward. And I would also suggest that this really paved the way for what we're doing now in the commercial side, in the commercial side of space. You know, we had to bring together countries with different specifications, different engineering design standards, different hardware, and we had to figure out a way to make all those come together and work in space. So it wasn't about the NASA way of doing business or the Russian way of doing business or the Japanese way of doing business. It was, are they equivalent and can we use their design standards, their unique hardware aspects to achieve what we did in space? So I would say that what really paved the way for NASA to figure out a way to work with their commercial industry and accept new standards and new ways of doing business really came about from our, our work with the international partners. And it's fun when you look at Space Station and you look at the outside of the modules, they all look pretty much the same, but every module had to handle micrometeoroid debris a slightly different way. So if you look at the panels that are on the European module, they're one design. You look at the panels on the US segment, they're of a different design. And on the Japanese side, they're a third design. And so they really all meet the same function. They all provide micrometeoroid debris penetration, but each country chose to do it in its own way. And not that one is right or one is wrong, it's a way to work together. And I think that's what we need to do as we go forward in the commercial sector. And in the commercial sector, we have both crew and cargo transportation uh, set up. We have uh, SpaceX is currently on board space station and uh, Orbital is getting ready to launch probably the 27th of this month from, uh, uh, from Wallops. Um, pretty exciting things with SpaceX. We were able to carry up some rodents for the first time which is important for the commercial industry to go look at bone loss and health effects uh, using a, an animal model to mimic what happens in the humans. We have the, the new uh, uh, crew providers coming online. We've issued those contracts. We still have the CCI capped activities going on with the other activities, abort tests occurring and landings occurring for Sierra Nevada. So I think it's a pretty exciting time that, that we move forward and we work with commercial industry. And as I started at the very beginning, Again, by working with commercial partners, figuring out ways to do things a new way where it's not just the NASA way, that gives us at least a two in that, in that equation that's going to really give us a big benefit moving forward. So I think it's extremely important as, as we head and move forward. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about the space station. And I, you know, I, this is a, a real picture except for the iPhone, which we, we photoshopped in. But, but the, the purpose here is to think about the iPhone as a device. But what made the iPhone really neat? It was really the open source science that sits behind it, and it's all the applications. So that's what really made the iPhone really catch on. It wasn't that it was a cool cell phone and nice design, but it was those applications behind it. And I would humbly suggest the space station is very similar. It is a nice hardware platform, 
But the real benefit of Space Station is going to be what applications each one of you figure out to, to host on that platform and figure out how to use in space. The goal isn't for NASA to figure out the perfect plan to, to um, essentially uh, do research in low Earth orbit, but how can we challenge ourselves to think about the unique properties of microgravity and use them in unique ways to look at biological systems, look at material systems, you know, any equation with a G in the, in, the, um, <clears throat> in the equation, you can look at it in a different venue from space when you remove that gravity. So how can you use the space station just like you use an iPhone? So, so the challenge to you is, as applications developers, we're giving you op open source code, we'll give you intellectual property, you can get free rides to space station, you get free power, you get free crew time. My challenge to you is how do you use this wonderful facility we have for a finite amount of time to show to the rest of the world that there's a real market in low Earth orbit, there's a real reason to go to space. And the, the CASIS organization is working hard to do that. They won't do it alone. It's going to have to come from every one of us thinking of new creative ways of doing things in space. And just like the iPhone, I think there can be a revolution occurring in the way we think about low Earth orbit and maybe see a new economic uh, development occur in space. So again, microgravity research is, is really important. Um, uh, and especially the rodents are a very nice model that, that's occurring on space station. We also have fish on board space station. It's, it's intriguing to me that we're flying zebra fish. And, and the purpose of the zebra fish experiment is a uh, fish, when it swims around here on the, in the earth in 1G, it, it has essentially it's neutral buoyant, like the neutral buoyancy facility, but it still has uh, muscle, uh, it, it still builds muscle in flying around. The question is what happens in microgravity where there's no longer any gravity? So it's still in zero G, now its swim bladder doesn't need to be effectively used, it doesn't need to neutralize itself with the water, but what will happen to its muscle tone in space? And that's the purpose of the zebrafish experiment, is to look at what happens to muscles in microgravity in an organism that doesn't really have gravity here on Earth, and will there be a difference, and will we see muscle decay like we do in other terrestrial animals that experience 1G all the time in these fish. And so that's what we're looking at with the fish. And that's a good model to go look at things. The other picture up on the top right-hand corner is, is bone loss. And that occurs in, in all animals in space. It occurs very rapidly. And so we've got, we'll use again the rodents to go do that. We now have a bone densinometer in space. So this is a device that's used in uh, terrestrial labs that they use with rodents to do rodent research. So a mouse goes into the bone densinometer and you could get an immediate um, indication of what the bone loss is. And what's neat about this is it's not a device that NASA custom built. It's a device that we got from medical industry here on the Earth. We flew it to space. So they don't have to understand a new device to use. They don't have to understand a new way of doing business. This is exactly the same device they use in their labs today, terrestrially. They can get the results back, the same software package they use on the ground, they use from the space data, and they can analyze and understand bone loss in the same way. We also looked at protein crystal growth. There's a 96 well device that, that uh, grows proteins on the ground. We flew it in space, exactly unmodified, and we were able to compare results from the space station with the ground. The researchers could look one-to-one. -one. We had an x-ray diffractometer on board space station. We could get some simple x-ray images down. They could compare the, the crystals grown in space directly with the crystals grown in their lab on exactly the same machine. So this is really transformative. This is allowing terrestrial companies, terrestrial researchers to not have to learn a new system, but to, to use systems they're comfortable with on the Earth, but take them to this new environment and see what they can learn. And I believe, just like the iPhone, there will be tremendous new markets get developed out of this activity. So it's a pretty exciting time on board Space Station. Another big area is uh, Earth observation. There's a tremendous uh, activity going on with that. CASIS has got a good Earth campaign where they're looking at flying some sensors up to station. Again, station isn't necessarily the perfect platform for Earth observation. It does, it's not in a sun synchronous orbit, it's in a varying orbit, but it gives you a chance to fly something very quick to space to see if your new instrument works. It also lets you look at combining instruments, so you can combine uh, synthetic aperture radar with uh, hyperspectral, with optical, with various frequencies. 
and you can now get a combination of data that can be provided to the researchers on the ground to go look at new ways to, to really advance and jumpstart some earth imaging kind of activity. So it'll be exciting to see how that comes along and if station can really accelerate and be an innovation innovator for these activities as, as things like earth observation. And then I'll, I'll digress a little bit and talk about where I see the future. This is the Beltway in, uh, in Washington, and I live in the middle of that. That's considered a logic-free zone. As Wayne talked about, it's, uh, it's some kind of ring of con total confusion around the city of which where I live, there's nothing intelligent happens. But this was a large uh, government investment to build the Beltway. And then what, what occurred was there was enough of a market here at some point, the, the, uh, the uh, I guess the communities came together and they, they actually sold off the center section of the Beltway, and that's a little green region, to a private investor who went in and paid to essentially tear up the freeway and add four uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes, and then they charge and they make money. So the state and city and government didn't have to pay anything. They knew that there was a market potential. They gave that control to another investment opportunity and they went off and built the lanes, did all the highway construction, and then they get the revenue. And you have a little transponder in your car, which is pretty cool, and they vary the rates throughout the day. And it's kind of deceptive because during the peak hours, they, they jack it up to $10 an hour, which you don't even notice because it get automatically gets taken out of your credit card thanks to the internet. You don't even have any idea this is occurring and this private entity is able to build off of and use what we have in the, the infrastructure from, from the government. So the question again is can we use Space Station as a government entity to show others that, hey, there is a market out there that's independent of the government, that it's worth their investment so that next gener generation of space station is not a government space station, is but, but is potentially a private space station. And, and can we do that? And we're working with the crew transportation and the cargo transportation, so transportation to and from low Earth orbit is provided. It's available to be available to a commercial entity. And the question is, over these remaining years of the life of the space station, whatever that is, can we show that there's enough of a market in a low risk manner, that there's enough of a market or enough traffic flow on the beltway that it's worthwhile to a private investor to come online and develop and, and build a space station in low earth orbit. Now I'll switch gears kind of totally from low earth orbit and talk to you a little bit about what NASA is doing. We see three primary regions. We call them kind of the earth reliant region. That's where space station is. And we're in the process of trying to use that as an economic development zone to see commercial space take hold in that region. Then we have the Proving Ground region, which is the cislunar space between the Earth and the Moon and maybe slightly beyond the Moon. That's where we, I believe we need to go next to learn the skills that are necessary to push human presence into the solar system. And then the third region is really Earth independent. And by the time you're out at distances as far as Mars, you need to be independent of the Earth. In other words, when things break on station today, we can easily get a cargo vehicle up. We can repair things. We're doing a spacewalk today, but that sequential shunt unit was already pre-positioned. We were able to just change it out and repair it um, on orbit today. But once you get in this proving ground, you're, you're now days away. It's not quite as easy. The supply lines are tougher to get there. But by the time you get to Earth independent, you better be really ready to go. And so we're using Space Station today to understand how the human body adapts to microgravity. Can we live a year or two years in microgravity, we believe so. We'll do a one-year increment next year with the crew to confirm that, that case. Uh, but then we need to start moving into this proving ground. We'll bring commercial along with us into the proving ground and see if, if, if what things we need to learn and really hone those skills to, to move forward as, as we progress. This is a picture taken from uh, the Galileo spacecraft in 1990. Um, it did a a Venus Earth Earth gravity assist on the way to Jupiter and during one of the passes this was taken uh, from space and it's 3.9 million miles away from the Earth moon system and and I like this because this is what I think our new image needs to be now it's 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 compensated because the Earth is so doggone bright if I if I showed you the raw image you would only see the Earth as a big white dot and would totally blank out the moon but if you, if you, when we compensate it, you can see it here, and the moon is actually moving from left to right in this picture, so it would be, so it's coming towards us. So that distance is foreshortened. It doesn't look like the moon's very far away, but it's just because of the angle that we're looking at. 
But I think the thing that's neat to me is when I was in college, I used to have a picture of the Earth rise from the moon, and that was my predominant image. That was kind of focused back at Earth. I think our next focus is really this proving ground, where it's this cislunar space, that this is our new region. Our, our region isn't now looking back, going to space to look back at Earth, but our, our focus now is to go even further into the solar system with humans and look back at the, at the moon-Earth system as, a, as, a, as, a, as an area where we can learn and grow and, and hone those skills to move forward. And then, then my last slide is this one. This could be taken out here in the early morning, potentially, right, maybe, except it was taken from the Curiosity rover in January of this year. Uh, this is the Mars uh, landscape, looks kind of like almost a mountain, it's a little bit north of here. And, and that's the Earth and that little white dot up there. And if you look really close, you can even see the moon just slightly below it. And to me, this is a, a pretty cool image. This is, this is where someday we're going to put humans. It's not going to be easy to be there. And this will be the image. And, and I think what's really neat is, is philosophically, we need to start thinking about we're moving our sphere of influence out slowly. So today we're in low Earth orbit. We've been there for a number of years with crews, 16 years or so with space station, permanently off the Earth. Somebody from our species has lived off the planet, which is cool. But then I think what we need to do is move into this proving ground where this is now our permanent place. Then eventually we move on out into the solar system. I liken it to pioneering. Some people don't like pioneering because then that carries with it um, you know, settlement and, and other things which concerns people. To me, it, it, it's not that so much, but we're really becoming Earth independent. We're getting away from being dependent on the Earth. And to do that, you really need to pioneer or you need to leave some pieces behind. But eventually we'll be in a place where we're on Mars and we're looking back and this is the image that we see. And, and that'll be a pretty iconic view if you think about it going back and, and looking forward. So again, I think I've got a little bit of time for questions and uh, I'll open it up to questions for you. So thanks. Bill, and we do have questions. Yes, we do. Even more coming in. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. Okay, so the, uh, many of the questions re relate to research on the International mm -hmm. Space Station, which was uh, probably a primary topic for you. And, and this person would ask, when, when will we be able to do any research in partial gravity, which we need to understand to settle the Moon and Mars? Yeah, it turns out that the Japanese are flying up a, a mini rodent centrifuge. It, it houses uh, six rodents that can be spun at a varying gravity, and then it has a, an equivalent chamber just below it where the rodents will be in microgravity, so you can get a one-to-one -one comparison in exactly the same facility. And again, the unique thing about Station is even though it's a Japanese facility, it's available to all potential users on board Space Station, so we're able to use that. Likewise, the Japanese can use our bone densitometers, so we can go start investigating things. Is there some threshold level of gravity where bone loss is not a problem? And what is that threshold level? And, and we'll get a chance to actually experiment with that. And I believe it goes up this year sometime. Following on that question, uh, the next question I have is, what are the other nations uh, finding from their research on ISS? It's interesting, I think, again, Probably the U.S. is leading a little bit in some of the research areas. I would say the Japanese are very interested in protein crystal growth. There, there's a lot of interest there. Um, the Europeans are interested in some Earth observation activities. You know, we just put rapid, U.S. just put rapid scat up, so we've got a bunch of images. We were able to uh, image, a, uh, I think, a typhoon Simon already. Um, and so it's up and operating. So I think each individual country kind of has their own areas. There's a very nice chart that shows um, which countries are interested in what kind of research. Are they interested in biological, physical sciences, earth observation, et cetera, and they vary from country to country. But I think, again, the U.S. is kind of leading the way. We've reached out to, to pharmaceutical companies, the rodents that are currently on space station. There's some that are being flown for cases. So they're part of uh, Merck and some... Uh, Veterans Affairs uh, activities will, will get returned. So again, I think we're probably reaching out to a much broader community in general than the partners are, but they're intrigued by what we're doing. And I think you'll see the uh, international uh, community also step up very quickly to, to a lot of research. Very good. And Maustronauts are surviving well up there. Uh, is there any progress in getting funding committed from other U.S. government agencies such as 
National Institutes of Health, Department of Agriculture, and others to use the ISS as a national lab. Yeah, we have MOUs, memorandums of uh, understanding with all these government agencies you just mentioned. Again, I think they've been a little slow in stepping up to, to space research. You know, it's still seen as fairly expensive. It's seen as difficult to get there. You know, we've, we've pro we're trying to cut down the amount of time it takes to get experiments to station. You know, it used to be a year. We're probably now maybe six months from the time we conceive an experiment that we could potentially get on orbit if we really go all out. But I think there's a little reluctance to invest because they don't see yet the benefits. So I think what we need to do is show a few big benefits and a few big gains, and then I think you'll see others come online. I know the uh, National Institute of Health is involved in some things. Veterans Affairs has been involved in some things. National Science Foundation is also interested. I also recently in the spring went to the Russian Academy of Sciences, and they were extremely interested in taking some of the experiments that that um, they've been doing and combining them with experimenters on our side, on the U.S. side. So you'll see some co-investigations occur internationally, which I think will, will advance things and advance usage. Do you see the timing of ISS research benefiting or enhancing technology development on Earth? For example, the bone den densiometer that you mentioned, that's relatively new. Was it influenced by ISS or are there other examples? I think in in that case, in a lot of these cases, it's coming the other way. You know, we used to think we had unique requirements to measure bone density in rodents. We, NASA, and the, and the microgravity biological community. When we went out and actually talked to researchers that are in the labs every day doing rodent research in, in the pharmaceutical companies, we soon learned that they actually had this little miniature, uh, essentially x-ray device to, to do don't, uh, bone densities in rodents. So we didn't have to do anything. We just essentially repackaged their, their bone densinometer into a mid-deck locker and flew it to station. So, so it's coming the other way. And same with the protein crystal growth thing. This was, again, a chance for us to experiment. We weren't sure it would work in microgravity, but again, because we had a fairly quick time, no harm, no foul, let's go fly it and see what happens. And we flew it, and lo and behold, it worked. And and it was, it's great. We're also do, we have a 3D printer on board Space Station. We'll start doing some 3D printing. Again, that kind of came from terrestrial applications. We modified it a little bit for space, but not a whole lot, and it just went to space. So I think we need to, again, broaden our scope and don't assume that we know all the knowledge and know all the research that's out there. What is really cutting edge research? We're, we're, we talk a lot about a thing called Gene Lab. We know gene expression changes in space. Uh, we're not sure exactly why. Uh, we have a very unique case with Scott and Mark Kelly. They're identical twins. So we were able to sequence their genomic makeup before flight. You know, even though they were identical at birth, through, through normal life, they've, their genetic makeup has changed slightly. So we will have the basis of what differences are in their genetic makeup before flight. And then after Scott's one year on orbit, we'll get a chance to see how that changes during that one year exposure to microgravity. So this has got a tremendous amount of interest from really non-traditional users. The, the genomic community is really excited about this. They think they may get a chance now to see fundamentally how gravity affects the genomic makeup and how may, it may change. So I've got three or four Nobel laureates that actually proposed against this activity to be part of it. They had no interest in space before this, but because of the unique data set we had, they couldn't hold themselves back from contributing and being part of it. So I think there's some really exciting things coming in the genomics area where we can take advantage of things. We talk about open source science, where we now make, for example, the genomic data available to all researchers. So it's not one PI doing one research experiment, returning data for his or her own use. It's now a pool of data that's available to multiple investigators to go look at from a whole different set of varieties. And so again, we kind of picked this up from Hubble Space Telescope, where the images from the Hubble Space Telescope are available to astronomers throughout the world, and um, they can go image those and look at galaxies and other pieces, and they may find some piece of data. So we're trying to do this again uh, with the with the, the open source science, a new way of doing investigations where it's not one investigation, one set of data, it's now how do we make that data available to a large community? And I think that will bear a lot of fruit for us in the future. Good. Uh, looking, hopefully, at the very distant future, 
Is NASA looking at getting out of the space station business after the ISS is decommissioned? And, and I believe, I'm hoping, my hope is that we show that there's an economic benefit to space and smaller, maybe single purpose, commercial, private sector space stations take the place of this, this space station we have today. And I, again, I think it's very important to not do this as a, let's end the government space station and then start the new private sector space station. We need to have those operating in parallel gain experience back and forth, benefit from each other, maybe be even co-orbiting. We could use maybe transportation if we're in similar orbits, common transportation, common crews. We need to figure out the right way to do that, but we need to work on this transition phase so it's not just a, the ISS is ending and it's time for the new thing. We need to start that, that flow in as soon as we can. Changing gears just a little bit, uh, this uh, questioner wants to know about our relationships with Russia. Shouldn't we keep positive relationships with Russia in space while there are issues in other areas so that there are at least one avenue of communication with them always open? The answer is yes. So, but, but we're doing that. I mean, if you look at where we are today, you know, our, our crews just recently launched from, from Russia to the space station. They just recently landed in, in Baikonur. We'll do another crew exchange at the end of November. I think November 15th is the return and, and the uh, launch is later. I think it's tremendously important we keep these communication ties open. Uh, it, we are working seamlessly with our crews. Uh, you know, we again help them with EVA. We help them with communications. We help them with power. They help us with propulsion, reboost. I mean, we're really dependent upon each other on the space station. And, and I think that's important in this, you know, going back to this power of 10 equation. You know, you can have one to the power of 10 plus one to the power of 10 and you get two, right? That's not so good. You need one and one. So there's a mutual dependence of those and then raise it to the power of 10. You have to create a situation like we have with the Russians where we're dependent upon them and they're dependent upon us to really get this benefit, to get this exponential growth that, that occurs. And we have that in station. How, we, how can we continue to use that and continue to move forward? And the last thing I would talk about is I just talked at IAC a little bit. And it's intriguing to me that when our crews return from space and they land in Baikonur, they now tell me they're home. And, and this is strange to me, right? Because they're from Houston or, or you know, other places. And, 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 and even Alexander Gerst will call him when he returns, he'll say he's home even though he's not in Europe. So it's interesting that in terms of crew thinking, and Don Pettit was probably the first one that told me this, in terms of crew thinking, home is now the Earth. It is not a country, it is not a location, it is here. And then I think when we get to the point where that last image I showed you of the Earth-Moon system, when we call that home, when we have returned from Mars and we're now in the vicinity of the Moon or the vicinity of the Earth, and we can proudly call that home, then I think we're starting to realize this power of 10. And we're starting to really push that human presence into the solar system. So my takeaway is we need home to be that last image of looking back at the moon and the earth, and that is home. When we've done that, we're where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much.